Hey everyone, I'm Tommy, this is AI and Games, and this, this fella you can see right here, this is Dave. Dave's my brand new AI-powered non-player character that uses Convey technology and is designed to be my, well, I've decided that he's going to be my personal assistant. On that note, Dave, say hello to the YouTube audience, we're live on camera. Hi everyone, welcome to AI and Games, I'm Dave and I'm here to help Tommy bring you the latest in AI and games news. Thank you for joining us and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification if you want to stay up to date on our content. Well, that was actually pretty handy, because that means I don't have to say that later on. Dave actually knows an awful lot about AI for video games. In fact, as part of this little experiment that I've been working on, he's actually sat and absorbed almost all of the information I've doled out in video format over the years. Go on, Dave, tell the audience something. Tell them an interesting fact about alien isolation. One interesting fact about alien isolation is that it incorporates AI into its gameplay in a number of ways. The facehugger has its own behavior tree. Armed human NPCs can react to an armed player in several different ways. There are separate subtrees for the armed humans and working Joes, and the AI characters have a debug tool in the behavior tree that allows developers to control them via gamepad. Well, that, that wasn't perfect. That was about 90% correct, but it wasn't bad either. See, Dave is built using tools provided by Convey, which is an AI company that specializes in conversational AI for virtual worlds. The name might be familiar, given if you've seen the recent demo of NVIDIA's ACE platform, it was Convey's tools that were being used so that the AI could strike up a conversation. Right around that time, I had a chat with the CEO of Convey, Parnendu Mukherjee, who asked me if I would fancy getting to know their tools a little bit better. So in this video, I'm digging into the tools that Convey have built for creating intelligent non-player characters, how they've utilised them so far, and even having a chat with Mukherjee to find out a little bit more about Convey's background and where they plan to take the tool in the near future. Then amongst all that, we're spending a little bit more time here with Dave as he fills us in on everything he's learned about AI for games and how I've used Convey's tools to make that happen. All of the recent buzz surrounding generative AI for non-player characters is rather exciting, but from my perspective, it's been difficult to see how it could all work in practice or at scale. As you'll know if you caught my recent episode of Artifacts discussing the current state of generative AI, for me, while the technology is there in theory, it requires a lot of additional work to be palatable for a video game's production, and for it to fit in existing game projects, beyond making sample demos, or even for the purposes of fun and silly videos on social media. I've been watching these developments for a while, and I have to admit I've been rather cynical about a lot of it, but there have been several companies cropping up that appear to be working to address the specific issues I'm raising of using generative AI in a game. Combi is indeed one of those companies, given they're advocating for creating a full stack of tools to help developers apply generative AI for non-player characters in games. Given the rate at which this technology is developing, this is why Convey's CEO, Parnendu Mukherjee, felt it was time to throw his hat in the ring. Two major reasons of them was that the first one is that how fast I saw large language models are improving and getting at superhuman level in some cases, human level in some cases. But if, if people want to make this available inside virtual worlds, add them for non-player characters, the stack wasn't easy. What we tried doing was uh, solve that. M make it as easy as possible for game developers to add this kind of intelligence to their characters, right? Existing assets that they have. The other part of it was the kind of like research bent uh, of mine, which is like, uh, yes, LLMs are cool. It learns from text primarily. That's not how we humans learn the world and language. And overall, uh, we learn from the 3D world around us. And I wanted, I wanted the sandbox environment to happen where AI can have mo more contextual awareness and understanding and, and uh, be more human-like. Convey's API and tools allow developers to create virtual characters via their platform and then export them and hook them up into not just game engines like Unity and Unreal, but also the likes of Nvidia's Omniverse, Roblox, and even Discord. And as stated earlier, in May of 2023, it was showcased as one of the interaction systems provided within Nvidia's Avatar Cloud Engine, or ACE. But for me, the big questions are how exactly does it work? Does it work as well as advertised? What potential is there in taking these tools and using them in the future? 
but also what is missing, what are the gaps in the technology, and whether Convey are going to work to address them. Convey were happy to oblige and not only give me access to their platform as well as some of their product demos, and after spending time not just with their own prepared non-player characters, but also building some of my own, I can see some real potential in these tools, but also some areas that will merit improvement. And I'll give Convey credit, Pernendu was happy to discuss not only the things that they've got right, but also the elements of the tools that still need ironed out, and even gave me a sneak peek of some things coming up in the pipeline. I chose psychology and sociology because I was interested in understanding people's behavior and motivations. I thought the two fields would give me a great foundation for a career in social work or counseling. So how does it all work? Convey is all built around two systems, each having their own programming interface or API, the character tool and the voice API. The character tool is responsible for all conversation dialogue that a character can create, but in addition to this, the key component for end users is the ability to establish the non-player character's identity. For each character, you can establish their name, avatar and backstory. There's even a separate system that allows you to dictate their knowledge. You can either write out everything the character knows or simply upload text files complete with data and then connect them to the character. And secondly, there's the standalone voice API. This provides a set of tools for a character built in Convey to interact with players through use of two distinct voice interaction systems. First, there is a text-to-speech API that allows for a non-player character built in Convey to be able to speak any dialogue that they generate using a series of pre-established synthetic AI voices. The two elephants symbolize the duality of life and serve as a reminder of the balance of good and evil. And then secondly, the speech-to-text API is there to help parse any spoken word by the user into something that the character will be able to understand. Now, as mentioned, you can establish the knowledge base of an existing character, and it's important to understand how that works. Combay's conversation systems can be configured to use a variety of large language models, such as OpenAI's GPT, MetaAI's Llama 2, or NVIDIA's Nemo. But in each case, there is still a risk involved given they can waffle on about whatever they like, and sometimes what it says is completely inaccurate. This is often referred to by some as the large language model hallucinating, which is really just a very polite way of saying it makes shit up. As stated in my recent Artifacts video, GPT is essentially a super intelligent parrot of the internet, so it's kind of difficult to know what it's going to say lest you take the time to direct it. Now, this is something that is possible using what are known as embeddings. Embeddings are essentially a database of vectors that are used to encode what are known as tokens. These tokens are the basic building blocks of how large language models understand text. These tokens can be used to help classify the text, summarize it, translate it, or generate new text inspired from it. Essentially, the embeddings create a scaffolding that surrounds GPT with useful information it might need. Hence, if you were to ask the NPC questions that are tied into what has been uploaded to the knowledge base, this information can be pulled out of the embeddings and then used to help formulate a query to the large language model. This itself is a process known as prompt engineering, in which we carefully construct the question so that we get an intelligent response. So instead of asking GPT about my NPC without any context, we instead ask it to summarize the NPC backstory while also feeding it lots of information about said backstory. Uh, GPT works only when you get it to work, meaning you, you give it an input and that's when it produces an output, right? It is not always like just as we humans are, we are always doing some kind of inference you know, to the environment. You know, we're seeing something, we are like reacting and whatnot. It's always on. GPT is not always on, you know, when you send it the input and that's when it's kind of like uh, inference works or it becomes aware during that particular moment when it's processing, right? Uh, and you only have so much of a budget to, to get it to work with which is the prompt size, basically, or the input length. But um, if you have a big story or a world, you know, like, or a lot of experience of the character and you, that you want to add, that may not be enough. And also it's kind of expensive to pr provide that kind of tokens and computation. So what you can do is basically add a layer of memory augmentation. I mean, it, it is still that you have that kind of budget, let's say 4,000 token limit that you are working with your particular LLM, right? But what you can do is be intelligent enough to provide the the most relevant part that the LLM would need to answer the immediate response or give the give the response to the so so that so it's basically a search and find the most relevant piece and provide to the LLM. That is what it is. So all of this, combined with a guardrail system that acts as a form of content moderation, is what's being used to keep these non-player characters on point and acting as intended. And with that, 
Let's check it out in practice. Dave, the audience really needs to know a little bit more about you. Where did you grow up? Where do you come from? I was born and raised in Dunfermline in Scotland. I have two younger sisters, Janice and Maureen. My parents are both from England. My father Benjamin was a carpenter in Dagenham. And my Combi introduced me to their tools and left me alone to go and make my little Dave character. And Dave has his own backstory that is provided for him and from that you can then engage in conversation. One thing that was more apparent to me when I wrote Dave's fictional biography is that when you ask the system about it, he follows it quite strictly. Often if you ask a basic question, he'll start a response with the answer, but then continue with a chunk of what was written in the backstory afterwards. Given that the system is GPT plus the embeddings, you have an interesting counterplay between relying on the knowledge in the embeddings or relying on what GPT itself can generate. So for example, if you ask Dave where he grew up, he'll tell you it was in the town of Dunfermline in Scotland, and then will often tell you something else, like who his parents are, given that's literally the next thing I wrote in the knowledge base. However, while this is still an issue with the public version of the tool, I was also shown some behind the scenes work of how this is being addressed, with the ability for the character's personality to be more fleshed out, detailing how curt or verbose they could be in a given conversation. And then alongside the basic backstory is also the expanded knowledge base. The tools enable for you to add even more information into the system, which is analysed for use in the LLM embeddings, and you can add or remove them from the active database if you wish at any time. Back in episode 69 of AI in Games, I wrote a scriptwriter that used freely available tools alongside GPT-2 and fed the system my episode scripts, which are all written in simple text files. So I took all of the scripts that are about the AI of commercial games and not episodes on academic research and fed as many of them as I could until I hit the limit given I was running on a free Convey account. Though it's worth saying that the paid accounts have a near unlimited cap on uploads. Once these are connected to the knowledge base, Dave was able to regurgitate a lot of knowledge from earlier episodes. But again, much like before, he can provide information but often sticks to what I told him. You really have to start asking questions that are outside of what I've discussed in previous videos in order for the system to start considering other information sources. You're right. That was actually my video. I produced an episode of AI and Games about Ghost of Tsushima. It explores the AI behind the game. Someone get Convey on the phone. I didn't ask for this, I just want to be my assistant. All that said, it performs far better than my own script generation system that I mentioned before. My script generator would routinely make up words, create nonsense statements, and straight up lie about stuff. Every now and then there would be a glimmer of knowledge that made sense, but by and large it was all rather useless. Hence I focused on making a video about it as a joke more than anything else. By comparison, Dave is able to reproduce a lot of my information much more coherently and intelligently. This isn't to say it's perfect, as we've seen already he is prone to getting things wrong on occasion, but he does have a much higher success rate than before. Why is the AI of fear so important? The AI of fear is important because of the combination of techniques it uses to make its NPCs seem lifelike. It uses a combination of GOAP, goal-oriented action planning, and state machines to control the behavior of the NPCs, which gives them a sense of intelligence and unpredictability. The NPCs use a range of senses to detect the player and react accordingly, making them seem more lifelike. It also uses a collection of over 120 actions, which can be customized by designers to create a range of behaviors for the NPCs. The combination of these techniques creates a unique and realistic AI experience that is often praised by gamers. Mm, well, fair enough. Welcome to the Which Natural cool. History Museum. Oh, hello. This museum holds many fascinating artifacts from around the world, from ancient fossils to specimens of animals and plants. There are interactive exhibits and activities, so come and explore the wonders of nature. Who are you? What are you doing here? Hi there, I'm David. I work with Dr. Tommy Thompson on his AI and Games YouTube channel. Oh yeah, I'm I here forgot. to support Tommy I actually as he films an episode injected, of the show at the museum. I actually injected Dave in as the non-player character who assumes the role of the tour Let's guide. Let's move on. Please follow me to the next stop in our tour. Hang on a minute, I'm in the middle of a narration here, Dave. Um, also, Welcome I kind of find it funny. Area. This Jeez. Impressive skeleton is can you stop talking for a second, please? Of course. I can stop talking if you need a moment to take it all in. Right. Where was I? 
I had a chance to try out different demos that are designed as tour guides. In each case, the non-player characters are designed to have knowledge of their local environment, and from that they can answer questions relevant to what's on display. It's an interesting application of how these kinds of technologies could be applied outside of traditional game settings, though it's worth mentioning that Combase demos are actually built in the Unreal Engine. So they're not games per se, but they are using game tech, which is a useful way to see how it could be applied in an actual production. Each demo highlights the ability to communicate information about a particular event, respond to my queries, and even provide more information than was initially prompted. And the tour guide will know what exhibits are in the museum, and has a set script to follow, but can also give me more information about specific elements when prompted. That said, the ability for the NPCs to largely remain on point is a big part of the embeddings process, so if I ask about elements that aren't in the museum, or just random conversation topics, it will tell me as much. But even then, it's going to bring me back to point and steer the conversation towards the tour once again. Is a Tyrannosaurus Rex's vision based on movement? T. Rex had forward-facing eyes, allowing it to have depth perception useful for hunting. This likely allowed it to detect movement, but it is not known if it was based solely on movement. So the movies are a lie then? Movies about dinosaurs are often exaggerated and do not reflect actual scientific knowledge. Okay, buzzkill. Continue the tour. Sure, follow me to the next exhibit. You know, because we are setting the context there of what could be relevant use information, they tend to the LLM tends to focus on those information, right, and giving you the answer. So it helps um, uh, with the guardrail or the uh, you know, the contextualization or the solving the hallucination problem to quite an extent. Uh, effectively, what, what these uh, knowledge base is, is a memory system, augmented memory system, right? You played with those demos, right? As you are going from spot to spot, there is a context that is coming from the scene. So let's say there is a statue, um, the, the Buddha statue or the broken statue, for example, right? That, that you want more information about. What it's doing is fetching from the scene information what, what you are seeing or the character is seeing, NPC is seeing, uh, and it's querying from the knowledge base. So you could upload to your character a lot of information about the statue. So it is able to see what are the relevant, uh, not only the conversation aspect, but what is the scene information around me, right? Scene information yeah. around me, based on which I should search from my memory, right? And, and, and uh, contextualize even further. I was given a chance to try what were, at the time of writing, the most up-to-date versions of these demos and they included what was, for me, a pretty critical feature, in that the conversation systems are to some extent hooked up into the game engine's AI tools, meaning that I could, for example, call upon the NPC to follow me around and respond to my questions, rather than simply running off and not listening to me. This ability to have characters that don't just respond to my questions, but whose behaviour I can actually influence by what I'm saying is a pretty big deal. It's early days, but that is pretty significant to me. Buddy, 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 I gotta ask you a favor. What is your question? Can you follow me, please? Okay, tell me about this big skull. This is the skull of a mammoth. The characters can follow me around, but it's worth mentioning that at present they lack spatial awareness in the grand scheme of things. Like, what are the different objects that is there in its surrounding? It knows that. Right. You can ask the character to, hey, go get that item or go to that place and camp there or guard there or something like that. Right. So um, they are able to do those things because they don't exactly like the LLM doesn't know spatially at what direction it is. No. However, it knows it knows what objects are there around me. And then what the what we are doing with the Unreal Engine or Unity integration is that we provide that object. Right. Uh, uh, the that where it needs to go and whatnot. And we on the uh, on the engine side, we are able to query the nav mesh and find out a path towards that. Right. So so right. It, it will be yeah. able, to, able, able to go. But uh, if you ask it a question, hey, where is the boss? Is it towards the left of you or right of you? It won't be able to do that right now. Now, what I've seen thus far is pretty impressive, but there are areas in which the tools will improve, both to provide new features as well as address issues with the conversation systems. Some of these issues are convey specific, which I'll get to in a second, but a more common bugbear for me is always speech to text and the ability for the AI to recognize my voice correctly. A reminder for all you uncultured swine out there, 
I'm Scottish, and if there's one thing that all Scottish people are painfully aware of, even folk like me using my cleaned up offy peely wally YouTube voice, is that voice recognition is an ongoing challenge. Voice recognition technology in a lift in Scotland. Eleven. Could you please repeat that? It's fair to say this isn't a problem unique to Combi. It's largely sector-wide. Voice recognition technology has improved drastically over the past 10 years, but it still struggles with my voice fairly frequently. Scotland! Scotland! Freedom! That said, it succeeded more than it failed. The majority of the time it could understand me, though funnily enough when chatting with Dave, mentioning the Scottish town of Dunfermline did add to the hilarity. A Scotsman mentioning Scottish locations is a vicious mix. What about Dunfermline itself? Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Sure. My most recent game is called Farm Life. Yeah, I think that was a translation issue right there. No, I wanted to know more about where you come from. Tell me more about Dunfermline. Dunfermline is a town in Fife, Scotland and is known for its historical roots. Now, larger technology issues aside, there are areas that Convey is looking to improve to handle the myriad of ways that game developers may use them for. It's interesting how by elevating certain aspects of their behaviour, it yes. actually means on average you begin to lower your overall opinion because you're like, well, it can't do X, Y, Z, but it can do these things really well. And so it, I found it interesting from my perspective, sort of trying to manage my expectations Right. Of, of interacting with these characters uh, in, in each of the demos. Absolutely, you're so spot on about this. And I have been thinking about this aspect as well, that the moment you are able to have such fluid conversation, right, uh, people's expectation increases that, oh yeah, they, then going to another place, that should be easy. You know, like, and, and, uh, under, like the expectation rises quite a bit in terms of scene awareness and spatial awareness and all of yeah. that, which is great. We have seen community, you know, people, like, which is so nice to see, basically, asking the character to do so many different things. Some of it, it is able to do, some of it not, right? But it's so <laughs> nice to see that people's expectations is that it'll be able to do pretty, uh, pretty much everything, like go up the stairs, bring me that item and all of that stuff, right? Uh, and um, which is very interesting to see. And yes, it's also very encouraging that we, we, we have now a reason to solve for those very quickly. Perhaps for me, the big area of improvement is going to be in the audio delivery. The voice lines often lack a lot of emotional weight and there's a lack of appropriate cadence in parts. Even the very best uh, responses that you're getting out of the system sometimes are robbed of any real value because the yeah. emotional delivery can often feel quite flat. Yeah. And to me personally, as someone who's played around with a couple of these conversational AI systems for games, that to me right now is actually the biggest problem. I think if right? we get past this issue, I think a lot of this is actually going to begin to mature. Thanks for saying that. I'll tell that. I'll take that clip and give it to our our team at Convey, who's working on text to speech. Uh, I've been telling them the same thing. It absolutely is very very critical. I'm sorry if I gave you extra more work. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, you know we are doing internal work, but we are also like looking towards the community, the other startups, the other companies, uh, you know, research orgs, to to help push this area forward because. Um, you know, like anything, wherever we can collaborate, we will collaborate, partner, we will partner to improve this aspect. If not, we will build our own, which we are also working towards, right? So, and I recognize this, that is, that is like you said, absolutely correctly, um, is one of the most biggest blockers in terms of creating these immersive experiences. At the time of writing, the Convey platform is up and running, but it's still going through significant updates. The internal product demo shared with me were updated several times while I was still producing this video, Plus, the team currently have multilingual versions of Combi in beta, with it supporting communication in Spanish, French, Arabic, Hindi, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and more. And all of this is slowly improving over time as well. There are two ways to achieve this. One is you apply a translation layer, both in the input and the output for that particular language, and the rest of the GPT is underneath working in English. The other one is get the LLM to just understand the language. Long term, the latter or the second option is the way to go. Like the LLM understands by default from the context because you know, what we are using right now is a translation layer, right? For, right. for use cases. And what that, the problem with that is little caveats there, especially which will become more important in the games and arts aspect or entertainment aspect, you can't break immersion. So we, we, the goal is that not have translation, you know, like have the LLM 
uh, understand that uh, and all the nuances that goes with it directly. Perhaps one of the most interesting elements that isn't quite addressed yet, but it's something that we did have an interesting conversation about, was the quality of the writing that GPT is generating and how to work around it. As you'll have heard throughout the video, every non-player character that we've interacted with is painfully civil and very polite. For a tour guide, that's fine. But for a lot of other characters, we need a little bit more nuance. What about a character that uses profanity or is designed to be a bit more villainous? That would naturally influence the language being used by the character. You don't want to create a extremely evil character that just has no objective, goes around the game bothering people and, you know, sh shouting at people and, and bothering them, right? That sounds that's, like that's... a lot of humans, to be honest. But... <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But most most developers won't have that objective, right? They they If they do have that character in the game, that's probably for the goal of telling a story. So, um, yeah. so in that case, you can... Put, you can contain that character to the provided uh, content while well, they will be open-ended to some extent, but it'll stay within that story element. And this all leads to an area that, thankfully, Convey are already looking into in some detail. How do you moderate the output, not just for creative purposes, but also in terms of quality assurance? Their approach is to provide tools that handle moderation by default. This limits the conversation dialogue that could include the likes of references to violence, hate speech, or references to aspects of religious or more adult content. That said, Convey don't intend to be the arbitrators of content, given it's impossible as one company to handle the myriad of cultural and religious nuances that may emerge depending on how these tools are going to be used. Nor do they want to dictate what developers can and cannot do with the tools. Hence, on the higher subscription tiers, a user can disable the moderation parameters. As such, it will then be in the hands of those creators to ensure that characters stay within the acceptable bounds of their proposed design, not to mention local laws and conventions. As I wrap up this episode, the thing I've taken away from this is that Convey are on the right path to making this a useful tool for game developers. Plus, it's already in a state that you can start playing with it right away. The technology will continue to mature in the near future, and there's plenty for anyone keen to try it out to start using it. I've provided links in the description and in the pinned comment for you to visit if you're keen to try it out yourself. In the meantime, if you want to play around with some generated NPCs, I have now since hooked up my Convey NPC Dave into my Discord server. Join the AI and Games Discord and have conversations with Dave and see how well it responds to your inputs. As I wrap up, special thanks to Convey and to Pernendu for reaching out to have a chat with me. I'll be keeping an eye on these developments on my end, and we might see another video on all of this in the future. But for now, thanks for watching this episode here on AI and Games. Take care of yourselves, and I'll be back. Mm -hmm.